The title of our sermon this morning is Render Your Verdict. Render Your Verdict. We're in part two, and we work, we're working through the Gospel of John verse by verse, and we come this morning again to John chapter 19, verses 1 through 16. As we work through this text, we began with verses 1 through 3 last week. As we work through this text and dig into the details of John chapter 19, verses 1 through 16, the Lord Jesus Christ now is rapidly approaching his foreordained appointment with Calvary. Pilate is weak. Pilate is compromising. Pilate is cowardly. He simply refuses to do what he knows that he should do. And Pilate is inching closer and closer now to the precipice of a full and final break with his accusing conscience. The violent mob outside the praetorium is growing. They're growing both in numbers and they're growing in their bloodlust to see the Lord Jesus Christ here put to death. The Jewish leaders are undeterred in their plan to murder him. And the Jewish leaders are working amongst the crowd, fomenting a mob mentality, inciting the crowd to an increasingly forceful and increasingly irrational demand. Crucify him, right? We see Pilate, we see the mob, we see the Jewish leaders, but we see Jesus. Right. In these verses, we see the Lord Jesus Christ made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. It was fitting for him, for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Now, Jesus here has been subjected to a brutal scourging and a merciless reviling at the hands of hardened Roman soldiers. Unimaginable pain. Unimaginable pain. As the scourge tore into his flesh, into the flesh that he voluntarily took upon himself as the Son of God in order that he might taste death for, death for everyone. As he bore the shame, the humiliation that we deserve counting it a trivial thing compared to the joy that was set before him. And time and again now, Pilate goes before the mob to announce that he finds no fault in him. Finally, Matthew records in Matthew chapter 27, verse 22, Pilate said to them, what then shall I do with Jesus who is called the Christ? We're faced with the very same question this morning. From our text... And we see the bloodthirsty mob of this world renders their verdict. They all said to him, Matthew chapter 27, verse 22, let him be crucified. And the governor said in verse 23, why, what evil has he done? But they cried out all the more saying, let him be crucified. And then Pilate, unprincipled, cowardly, compromising Pilate, looking out only for himself, his conscience pounding a drum in his heart and in his mind, in verse 24, when Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water, washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person you see to it. And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and on our children. And then he, Pilate, released Barabbas to them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Pilate like the mob, renders his verdict. What then shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? This is a life and death question. This is a question of life and death. This is a heaven or hell question. The most important question that you'll face in your life, what then shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? There's no middle ground here. There's no bipartisan compromise. There's no abstentions. You can't send this to committee. You can't put it off. Your delay of a decision is your decision. No further opportunity to consider this question when you're dead. It is appointed for men to die once and then the judgment. A fearful thing, right? the terrifying for th thing for you if you're outside of Christ, is that you and I, you and I, we were born into this mob that we see here. 
You and I were born into the mob that cries out for blood in the courtyard of the praetorium. Apart from the grace of God in Christ, to change your wicked heart, you run. You run with the mob of this world. You're a part of this mob among whom we also once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, as Paul says. So you rebel with this mob. You sin with this mob. The breath of your sin flows through the vocal cords of this mob as they cry out, crucify him. And with the mob, you crucify him again and again to your desires. Crucify the Son of God and put him to an open shame. Because you have the beating heart of the mob in your chest. We're born into that, do you see? And daily, right, daily, sometimes hour by hour, seemingly minute by minute, in the great mercy, in the great patience of God, you're called again and again and again and again to the pavement to render your verdict before you die. What then shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? Today, while it is called today, do not harden your heart. Will you turn your back on the mob today? Will you come out from the world today? Will you turn your back on your sin today? Or will you continue to turn your back on Christ? From these verses, John chapter 19, verses 1 through 16, as in the rest of the scriptures, we're to behold the Son of God. We're to behold the Son of God, pierced through for our transgressions, right? Bruised. For our iniquities, what then are we to do with this Jesus who is called Christ? John writes his gospel. The gospel of John is written for the purpose that you might have the evidence that is necessary. All sufficient evidence, necessary evidence to render a right verdict. To render a right answer to that question. He writes that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Well, that overarching purpose, providing the backdrop for our text, we see that evidence presented to us in John chapter 19, verses 1 through 16, in three ways. First, we are to behold the King. We looked at that last week in verses 1 through 3. Secondly, in our text, we're to behold the Son of God. We'll look at that this morning from verses 4 through 7. Next, we are to behold the righteous judge in verses 8 through 11. And then finally, we will behold the verdict of this world in verses 12 through 16. As we go, we're to see ourselves in the text. See ourselves in the crying screaming of the bloodthirsty mob. We're to see ourselves in the weak and vacillating and cowardly pilot. And we're given opportunity to render our own verdict. What then shall we do with Jesus who is called the Christ? Last week we began beholding the king in his glory in verses 1 through 3, where the text reads in verse 1, So then Pilate took Jesus and he scourged him. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe. And then they said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him with their hands. Now, Jesus Christ, we know Jesus Christ is the King. Not only the King of the Jews, but King of kings and Lord of lords. And in this text, we beheld the glory, the majesty, the divinity, and the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. One of his suffering. We beheld our King in his suffering. Secondly, we beheld our king put to an open shame. The physical suffering of the scourge at the hands of merciless Roman soldiers and the shame that was heaped upon him through a mock coronation and a scornful dishonor. Here, 
At the apex of all of human history, God now having sent his only begotten son into the world, this is how the world treats his only begotten son. This is what the world does with God when they take him in their lawless hands. Now you think with me now for a moment. It doesn't go far enough to say that this is how the world treated him. It simply doesn't go far enough to say that. I bear responsibility for what we see here. You bear responsibility for what we see here. He came into this world. Think about it with me. He came into this world and took upon himself a body. He says to God the Father in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 5, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. And then I said, the Lord Jesus Christ, saying to God the Father, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book it is written to me, written of me, to do your will, O God. Do you realize, do you realize that Jesus Christ will forever, Jesus Christ will for all of eternity in my sight bear the marks of my sin upon his back? will for all eternity bear the marks of your sin in his hands, in his feet. Absolute sovereign power, absolute sovereign authority, having stooped so low to save a wretch like me, to save a wretch like you, right? But this scene of his pity shouldn't provoke pity. This scene of his passion shouldn't provoke pity. It should provoke worship. It should provoke awe. It should provoke wonder and praise and glory and exaltation and honor because our eyes have seen the king, right? The Lord of hosts. In it, we see the, the tragedy of our own sin, but we see the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ given for sinners. Behold the king. But point two on your notes, we come to verses four through seven. And this morning, as we look at our text, we're to behold the son of God. Behold the Son of God. Verse 4. Pilate then went out again, and he said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then Jesus came out, in verse 5, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! And Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Now, the first thing I want you to notice in these verses is the tragic irony that is loaded, packed in here in verses 4 through 7. In verses 1 through 3, Jesus Christ is scourged, he's mocked, he's reviled for claiming to be king. The reality, and therefore the irony, is that he is king. He's the Davidic king. And they are scourging, mocking, and reviling God's promised king. Well, in verses 4 through 7, Jesus Christ, having been handed over, as Matthew says, because of envy, the Jews want dead because he claims to be the son of God. The reality here, and therefore the irony, is that he is the son of God. And they're crying out for the death of God's promised deliverer. So we come to verses 8 through 11. Pilate presumes to be the authoritative judge over Jesus Christ, who is the authoritative judge. These verses just packed with irony. And my, maybe like me, you guys have heard the, the story that preachers love to tell about the guy who's stranded on a roof, right? And the floodwaters are coming, the flood's rising, guy's standing on the roof, and he's waiting for God to save him. Guy comes along in a canoe, and he says to the guy on the roof, I've come to save you. And the guy on the roof says, no, thank you, I'm trusting God, and God is going to save me, All right? So Red Cross comes along in a boat. We're here to save you. The man responds, uh, no, thanks, I'm waiting on the Lord. The Lord will save me. So the National Guard then flies over in a helicopter, drops the ladder. We're here to save you. No thanks. Don't need saving. The Lord is going to save me. So the story goes, 
that the man finally drowns in the flood. Floodwaters overtake him. He stands before God and he says, I trusted you. Why didn't you save me? And God says to the man, I sent you a canoe, a canoe, a boat, and a helicopter. What more did you want? Now, if the story were true to life, and if the man on the roof were a Pharisee, the Pharisee would have stoned the guy in the canoe, stabbed the guy in the boat, shot the helicopter out of the sky, and standing before God, giving the opportunity, he would crucify God for implying that he even needed saving in the first place. In the parable of the wicked vine dressers in Luke chapter 20, God, represented by the vineyard, or represented by the vineyard owner in that parable, sends servants to his hired vine dressers for fruit. Wicked vine dressers beat those servants, treat them shamefully, wound them, and cast them out. So last of all, as the parable goes, he sent his beloved son. Surely, surely they will respect his son. So what do those wicked vine dressers do? It says in Luke 20 that they reasoned among themselves saying, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him that the inheritance may be ours. Now, incidentally, Luke says that the Jewish leaders knew that Jesus spoke the parable against them. They saw that the son, the heir, has come. They reasoned among themselves, let us kill him. The inheritance will be ours. And they knew that Jesus spoke the parable against them. So we see now the irony, right? The irony in these passages, these verses, isn't pointing specifically at the ignorance of the Jews. Think with me. The irony, the irony is pointing to their willful rejection of the truth. They are blinded by an unreasonable hatred. So what do they do? They crucify their king. They're blinded by an irrational envy. So what do they do? They kill the Son of God. That willful rejection, that blind hatred, that irrational envy is what fuels their murderous intent here. Why? Why? Well, Jesus says in John chapter 7 that they hate him because he testifies of them that their works are evil. Their works are evil. Stephen. Now, Stephen comes along and rebukes these same Jewish leaders in Acts chapter 7. Which of the prophets, he asks them, right? Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and the murderers. And what did they do with Stephen? Yeah, they drug him out and stoned him. So the irony here, the irony isn't pointing to their ignorance. You know, unbeknownst to them, they killed their Messiah. No. They've been given sufficient revelation. They've been given all sufficient revelation in Jesus Christ himself. The irony here, the irony points to their hard hearts. They kill him for claiming to be the one they simply refused to acknowledge that he is. Do you see? Jesus said to them in John chapter 8, verse 45, because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. You hear the order of that? Because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. And you and I, we have to recognize the same seeds of that same hostility in our own hearts, don't we? When you get self-righteous, when you get defensive, somebody comes alongside you to talk to you about your sin, and you get defensive, and you get self-righteous, and you get hostile, it's the seeds of the same hypocrisy in your heart that we find here in the Jews who are seeking to murder their Messiah. Leave me alone. I want to sit here on my roof, living my life, and I'd rather die here than submit myself to him. The tragic irony is that because you know the truth, you choose to reject him. In verses 4 through 7, Jesus, the Son of God here, 
is presented before these self-righteous men and they presume to render a verdict upon him. Verse 7 says he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. Now we're going to unpack that verdict from three perspectives. The revelation, the response, and the reason. The revelation of the son of God that they've been given. Their response to that revelation, and then their reason, the reason they give for the final verdict that they render. The revelation, the response, and the reason. So let's look first now, as we consider this passage, let's look first at the revelation that they have been given, beginning in verse 4. It says in verse 4 that Pilate then went out again, again. Now if you remember, the Jews, the Jews are outside the praetorium. They're outside the praetorium and they have murder in their hearts. They have envy in their hearts. Their hearts are defiled, but not wanting to be ritually defiled by going into a Gentile's house, they stand outside and Pilate has Jesus inside the praetorium questioning him. And so Pilate's moving back and forth now, moving from inside questioning Jesus outside addressing the Jews, moving back and forth between the two, inside and outside. So after now having questioned Jesus inside, verse 4, Pilate goes back outside to the Jews again and said to them, Behold, in other words, give me your attention. I want to make this very clear. I'm bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no fault in him. Pilate's making his point as clearly as he knows how here. Once again, he says, I have absolutely no basis for a charge. The accusations that you've made against him, that he's guilty of sedition, that he's guilty of revolution, that he's guilty of insurrection, guilty of treason, those accusations are all baseless. I find no fault in him. Verse 5, then Jesus came out. Upon that testimony... Jesus comes out himself, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate says to them, behold the man. Now, this is the official presentation of the one that they have accused. Pilate brings him out before rendering a verdict. Now, thanks to the Jews initially, and then thanks to Pilate, and thanks to the soldiers, there's no question at this point how he looks. Isaiah chapter 52, verse 14, many were astonished at you. So his visage was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. We can all imagine how he looked at this point, beaten, bloody, swollen, unrecognizable. Isaiah chapter 53, stricken, smitten by God and afflicted wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. By this point, the Lord Jesus Christ would have been a startling spectacle. The effects of the brutality would have been shocking. And he's displayed here before the crowd, before the Jews, before the mob, he's displayed here in the kingly garb of his mockery. The twisted crown of the curse upon his head, a faded, coarse garment, upon his shoulders. And Pilate here in verse 5 mocks the Jews with his presentation. Notice he's not king of the Jews now. Behold the man. You know, here's the guy that you said was so dangerous. Here's the threat. You know, take a look at him. I've beaten him senseless now. He's not a threat any longer. Look. Look at him. What the Jews don't fully understand at this point and what even the disciples will only come to understand after the resurrection and by the Spirit of God is that this is how the Son of God, their Messiah, this is how the Son of God has been revealed in the Old Testament. He is the suffering servant. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 42. Isaiah chapter 42. He is the suffering servant. This is their Messiah. This is their Messiah. And they hate him for it. In Isaiah, we have 
four what are called servant songs pointing to the Son of God, pointing the Jews to their Messiah. The ancient Jews were all of one mind that this was speaking of the Messiah. These servant songs that we see, the first is in Isaiah chapter 42, beginning in verse 1. Verse 1, Behold, my servant whom I uphold. This is the Lord God speaking, right? Matthew affirms in chapter 12, verses 17 to 21, that this is the Lord Jesus Christ. The servant is the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said, right, that although he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, he took the form of a, of a bond servant, took the form of a servant. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my elect one, my chosen one, in whom, God says, my soul delights. I've put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He will not cry out, nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. In other words, there aren't going to be trumpets that go before him. There's no fanfare, no parades, no pomp and circumstance. He says in verse 3, a bruised reed he will not break. Smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. He's gentle. He's patient. He's not coming to break or to quench but he will bear with them. He considers their frame that they are but dust. This is grace and this is mercy. And though he is rejected, and though he is despised by men, look at verse 4. He will not fail, nor will he be discouraged until he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands shall wait for his law. From Isaiah 42, turn to your right to Isaiah 49. Isaiah 49. And in a second servant song here in the prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah 49, look with me beginning at verse 7. Verse 7. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, their Holy One, to him whom man despises, to him whom the nation abhors. Matthew Henry said that to be despised by man who himself is a worm bespeaks of the lowest and most contemptible condition imaginable. He's despised by worms, abhorred by worms. Man whom he came to save and to put honor upon despised him and poured contempt upon him. Henry says, so wretchedly ungrateful were his persecutors. To the servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise. Princes also shall worship because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, and he, God, has chosen you. Thus says the Lord, verse 8, in an acceptable time I've heard you, and in the day of salvation I've helped you. I will preserve you and give you as a covenant, as a promise to the people to restore the earth, to cause them to inherit the desolate heritages. He's given as a covenant, right? He's given as a promise of all the blessings of the new covenant secured in him. God secures, the Lord Jesus Christ purchases the new covenant in his blood. And God was in him, reconciling the world to himself. The world who hates him, the world who despises him, the nations who abhor him. And God was in him, reconciling his own to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. Flip the page and look at Isaiah chapter 50. Isaiah chapter 50. Look beginning in verse 6. I gave my back to those who struck me. I gave my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. The Lord submitted himself to this treatment, do you see? For sinners. Verse 7, the Lord God will help me. Therefore, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint and I know that I will not be ashamed. Well, someone might say, well, what about all the shame that's heaped on him in the scourging? What about all the shame that's heaped upon him at the crucifixion? It's temporary. It's passing. Something that he counted a trivial, meaningless, worthless thing. 
temporary thing for the glory that is set before him, for the joy that was set before him. Again, he doesn't need our pity. (laughs) He is deserving of our worship. Verse 8, he is near who justifies me. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near me. Surely the Lord God will help me. Who is he who will condemn me? Indeed, they will all grow old like a garment. The moth will eat them up. In this life, living in this world, there may be times when you're shamed. There may be times when you feel a sense of shame for taking a stand for the gospel. Because of the scorn that this wicked world heaps upon those who are followers of Christ. Listen, brothers and sisters, that shame is is a worthless thing. It is a temporary thing. It is a fleeting thing. It is nothing, less than nothing, for the joy that is set before us, right? For the glory that will come because of the Lord Jesus Christ and all that Lord Jesus Christ has done. What he's done for you, what he's done for me. So let's with him, let's with him count that shame a weak and worthless thing. Let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach, because the Lord Jesus Christ is worthy. Amen. Flip the page and look at Isaiah 52. Isaiah 52, the fourth servant song in Isaiah. All this revealing, one of many, four here servant songs, of many texts in the Old Testament that all point forward to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is revelation that they had. If you remember from Acts chapter 8, verse 30, this was the point in which Philip overtook the Ethiopian eunuch in his carriage as he was reading the scroll of Isaiah and was reading here, the fourth suffering servant, the fourth servant song of Isaiah in Isaiah 52. Look beginning at verse 13. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man, his form more than the sons of men, so he, shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths at him, for what had not been told to them they shall see, and what they had not heard they shall consider. Again, the ancient Jews believed that this passage was referring specifically to their Messiah. Look at 53, chapter 53, verse 1. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? In other words, they don't believe our report because the arm of the Lord has not been revealed to them, right? Rejecting the truth of God in Christ, they forfeit the grace of God in Christ. Do you see? Verse two, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed." More than one occasion, I've read this passage in witnessing to Jewish people. Without telling them where it is, who is this speaking of? Well, speaking of Jesus Christ. (laughs) Written in Isaiah 700 years before Christ came. (laughs) Verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison, from judgment. Who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. They made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Verse 10, yet it pleased. The word there means delight. It delighted the Lord to bruise him. He, who is the he? 
the Lord. The Lord has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. His pleasure, his pleasure is the salvation of sinful men for his glory. And the efficacy of Christ's sacrifice, the efficacy of of Christ's atoning work displayed here was something that the Father delighted in. He delighted in it. Verse 11, he shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great. He shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, made intercession for the transgressors. Transgressors. He is the, the child born, the son given in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, right? His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He's the foundation stone of Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16. He's the Redeemer. In Isaiah chapter 59, verse 20. And all of this, all of this, right, from one book in the Old Testament. Jesus tells the Jewish leaders, these leaders that want him crucified, he told them in John chapter 5, verse 39, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. Psalm 22, you don't have to turn there. Just listen, Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Where do we hear those words? Jesus Christ on the cross. Why are you so far from helping me? And from the words of my groaning, written originally by David here, right? This is a messianic psalm. In verse six, David says, I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men, despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying, he trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Verse 13, they gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. Dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. You see all of that fulfilled by the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Son of God. He is the Son of God sent by the Father. Now you might object. You might object, right, and say that with all this evidence in the Old Testament, that for them, it would have been difficult for them to understand. For them back at that time, it would have been difficult for them to get all of this. Well, remember, on the road to Emmaus, in Luke chapter 24, Cleopas and another disciple were walking and talking. They were sad over all the things that had happened in Jerusalem to the Lord Jesus Christ. And Luke records in verse 25 that Jesus drew near and said to them, O foolish ones, you foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. They were slow of heart, right? Slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Is not this what the scripture teaches? And beginning at Moses, Genesis chapter 3, we have a promise of the coming seed, right? From Genesis on, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Behold, the Son of God. This is the Son of God from Genesis to Revelation. So back in John chapter 19, back in John chapter 19, this is the revelation that they've been given. And we've just seen a portion of that revelation, right? 
primarily one book from the Bible. In all of the scriptures, as the Lord Jesus Christ says in Luke 24 to those disciples on the road to Emmaus, all of the scriptures point to Christ. So now, having considered the revelation that they have, the revelation they've been given, what then is their ultimate response to the sum of that revelation? What's their response? When the fulfillment of all of God's promises is presented before them, embodied in the Lord Jesus Christ, when their Messiah comes, doing the will of the Father, right? Healing the lame, casting out demons, proclaiming liberty to the captives. How do they respond? How do they respond? Look at John chapter 19, verse 6. Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, They cried out, shouted. Again, that word, screamed. It has the sense of anger. They cried out saying, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, exasperated in disgust, you take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. Now notice first, notice first in verse 6, That ultimate responsibility for the response of the mob here is leveled against two groups primarily, the chief priests and the officers. That does not diminish the sin of the mob, but it levels primary responsibility here in verse 6 to the chief priests and to the officers. The mob certainly bears the guilt of their rejection. But it's obvious here that the chief priests and the officers were responsible for stirring up the crowd against him. Their hatred for the Lord Jesus Christ is simply irrational. In, in light of his innocence, in light of all the evidence testifying to who he is, their hatred here is irrational. It's unreasonable. It's brazen. It's unanimous. They all cry out. And these are imperatives so that you understand. These are not requests. You know, please take him and crucify him. No. These are imperatives. They're demands. They cried out again, meaning they cried out as they had already before, crucify him. That's the response of the mob, response of the Jewish leaders, the chief priests and the officers. Notice second, notice second, Pilate's response in verse six. Pilate's response. Pilate said to them, you take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. Now think about that statement for just a minute, right? Again, Again, Pilate finds no fault in him. Six times Pilate makes this, the comment that I find him innocent. He's innocent. But Pilate here certainly isn't going to take a stand for justice. Pilate wants free of this whole ordeal. And he thinks that by this, he absolves himself. I find him innocent. I found no basis for a charge. I found him not guilty. So you take him and crucify him. Now consider with me that Pilate's heart is corrupt. Pilate's heart is corrupt. And because Pilate's heart is corrupt, Pilate is cruel. In other words, Pilate doesn't take a stand for righteousness. He doesn't take a stand to release the Lord Jesus Christ. You take him and you crucify him. I find no fault in him, absolving himself of the whole matter. You crucify him. What is that to me? Pilate's heart is corrupt, and so Pilate is cruel. The same heart, listen, the same heart lies within every person who rejects the Lord Jesus Christ today. If you reject the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done for sinners, that same heart lies within you. If you're in Christ today, if you've turned from your sin and you've entrusted yourself to him, you trust him for salvation, that heart was once in you. We would attest to that. Who would say amen to that? Amen. Amen. We have to acknowledge that about ourselves. I reject the claim of Christ to be the son of God is what that person would say. I reject the work work of Christ on the cross. It's not a person here who doesn't see that, doesn't understand that to some degree. The Lord Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, and yet you reject that work. You reject the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, crucify him. What is that to me? You reject the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, cross, what is that to me? 
You reject that. They crucified him. What is that to me? Right? You're going to live your life in rejection of the Lord. The human heart is corrupt, and therefore the human heart is cruel. If these things don't move you, it's not because they aren't moving things. It's because your heart is dead and immovable. You know, human heart is corrupt, therefore the human heart is cruel. We don't want to be inconvenienced by a baby. And so let's kill the baby, right? The human heart is corrupt. And so the human heart is cruel, justifying the death of that baby up one side, down the other. I want my sin accepted, you know? I want my sin accepted. And so the Christian baker who won't bake a cake for my gay wedding, my gay mirage, let's take their business from them. Who cares about their religious liberty? What is that? I have my sin. And I want my sin accepted. The heart of man is corrupt. And so man is cruel. I don't like the way that church confronted me in my sin. So it's a cult. And all the people in it are lost. You want your sin. You want your sin. You want your sin and so you will leave your wife to have your sin. You will divorce your husband to have your sin. You will kill that baby. You will rebel against your parents. You will say and do cruel things in self-righteous anger, in self-justifying anger. Your heart is corrupt, and so you are cruel. And the fact that these, don't, these things don't cause you to put your head in your hands and weep before God and cry out to Him for mercy for the cruelty of your heart is further evidence that your heart is corrupt and you are cruel. And the human heart is hopelessly so apart from the grace of God in Christ. Amen? You need a new heart. You need a new heart. And Jesus Christ went to secure that promise for you if you will turn from your sin and you'll put your trust in him. Turn from your sin. You repent of that hard-hearted cruelty and trust Christ. The Spirit of God, the Spirit of God will produce in you love. The Spirit of God will turn you from cruelty. The Spirit of God will produce in you joy. In that once cruel, corrupt heart, there'll be peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. That's what the Lord produces in the heart of every genuine believer. It's exactly opposite of what we see in the heart of this mob in the Praetorium, isn't it? In the heart of Pilate. It's all produced by the grace of God in Christ, by the Spirit of God at work in a genuine believer, someone who's been born again. So after being given overwhelming revelation that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Jews respond with their verdict, crucify him. What's the reason that they give for the verdict that they render? What reason do they give? Look at verse 7. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die because he made himself the Son of God. So, up to this point now, the Jews have refused to explain themselves to Pilate. If you remember back in John chapter 18, verse 29, Pilate asks for an accusation, and they respond, If he weren't an evildoer, we wouldn't have brought him to you. Right? They refuse to give him an answer. So this is the first time in their interaction with Pilate they speak plainly about their charge, about their intentions. According to our law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. Now the law that they're referring to 
is found in Leviticus chapter 24, verse 15. I'll read that for you. Whoever curses his God shall bear his sin. And whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall certainly stone him. The stranger, as well as him who is born in the land, when he blasphemes the name of the Lord, he shall be put to death. The Jews then, here in John chapter 19, are accusing Lord Jesus Christ of blasphemy. Verse 7 explains that the basis for that charge of blasphemy is that he made himself the Son of God. He made himself the Son of God. They see that as blasphemous. In the way that Jesus claims this on the lips of any mere man, it would be. But not on the tongue of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now what exactly, more John irony here, what exactly do they believe that he is claiming by that title? Turn back with me to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. What do they believe that he is claiming by that title? John chapter 5. John chapter 5, and look with me beginning at verse 15. John chapter 5, verse 15. There's a man that the Lord Jesus Christ had healed by the pools there at Bethesda. In verse 15, the man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. So there were other reasons also that, he wanted, that they wanted him dead. And then Jesus, according to them, just adding insult to injury here, verse 17, Jesus answered them and said, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, what? Making himself equal, that's right. With God. The Jews know exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ is claiming here. And just by virtue of the revelation given to us in the New Testament, every Jehovah's Witness, every Mormon, should also, every Arian should also know exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ is claiming here and what they sought to put him to death for. Verse 19. Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, The son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the father do, for whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. Now look at this passage and look at all the parallels that take place, all right, between the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father. Understand that the teaching of the Bible with respect to the Trinity is that there is one God, one God in three distinct persons. And so the way that the revelation is laid out for us is careful, very careful to maintain one God, but also very careful to maintain that those three persons of the Trinity are distinct. And so what we see here in John chapter 5, one God, but these parallels in what that one God does, how the distinct persons of the Trinity act. Verse 17, my father's been working and I have been working. All right. Verse 19, whatever the father does, The Son also does in like manner. Verse 20. For the Father loves the Son, shows him all things that he himself does, and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. Verse 21. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son, we know the Son raises the dead and also gives life to whom he will. Verse 22. The Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son... Verse 23, just as they honor the Father. He does not honor the Son, does not honor the Father who sent him. Look at verse 24. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death into life. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming, now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For... As the Father has life in himself, he is eternal and unchanging. He is not created 
uncreated. He is eternal Father. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. This is the eternal generation of the Son. Verse 27, it has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this. The hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice, voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life. Those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. I can of myself do nothing as I hear I judge. My judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. There is a perfect economy of work, a perfect economy of will, a perfect economy of intent, a perfect economy of purpose in the Godhead between God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. There is no wasted energy. There is no divergence of purpose, divergence of will, right? They are one, <laughs> And does not Jesus Christ say the same? I and my Father are one. Now, Paul emphasized the same truth in Philippians chapter 2, verse 6. Jesus Christ, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Jesus Christ was equal with God. But Jesus Christ made himself of no reputation. He made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him, given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There's absolutely, absolutely no confusion about what Jesus Christ was claiming with these statements. He claims to be equal with God. And the Jews clearly understand that. The Jews intend to put him to death for blasphemy. They clearly get it. Now, more irony in John. More irony in John. The Jews want to put to death the Lord Jesus Christ to fulfill their law, which says a blasphemer should be put to death. So the Jews want to put the Lord Jesus Christ to death to fulfill the law. The Lord Jesus Christ dies to fulfill the law. Lord Jesus Christ comes, right? Right? where you and I, born under the law, could never keep it. Scholars, theologians talk about the three uses of the law, the three uses of the law of God. One of those uses of the law of God is to be a mirror. It's to be a mirror. The mirror reflects the glory of God the perfections of God, the attributes of God. That mirror of the law also reflects our horrid, despicable, destitute condition. It reflects our sin so that sin might become to us exceedingly sinful. And where we fail in every respect to keep the law of God and to reflect God's glory. He perfectly fulfills the law in its entirety. No sin of thought, no sin of word, no sin of deed. Perfect. Fulfills the law perfectly. And he's the only one who can. He is the son of God. He is the son of God. They want, him to, put, they want to put him to death to fulfill the law. The Lord Jesus Christ dies to fulfill the law. And he dies to fulfill the law so that we, through the body of Christ, might become dead to the law. Praise God. Praise God. Romans chapter 8, that we might fulfill the law in him. <laughs> Look with me real, really quickly at Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. Brothers and sisters, do you believe this? Do you believe this text? 
What a glorious, glorious truth. Look at verse 1, Romans chapter 7, verse 1. Do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives? For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. This is an illustration here, mind you, right? This is an illustration that the Lord is giving. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. Therefore, do you see the illustration? Do you see the example? Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ that you may be married to another, to him who is raised from the dead that we should bear fruit to God. What a glorious, glorious thing. Because of Christ, because Christ died to fulfill the law, you and I, brothers and sisters, you and I, we've become dead to the law and married to another. What a glorious, glorious truth. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. What is the purpose of all that? That we should bear fruit to God. We've died to the law in Christ. If you turn from your sin, you say, I don't live for myself anymore. Right? I don't live for myself anymore. I'm turning from my sin. I'm turning from my life. I am trusting Christ and I'm entrusting myself to him in all things then you are dead to the law by repentant faith in Christ. That no longer is a, is a means or a way by which you will earn right standing before God. You never can. You never could in the first place. And now you are married to another, that in you God may bear fruit to his glory. That's why we serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. The Jews, in John chapter 19 pride themselves on being obsessive law keepers. But while they suppose, while they presume to keep the law, their hearts are full of evil thoughts and adulteries, fornication, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. Do you see the hypocrisy of that? While they presume to keep the law, that's the condition of their heart. Maybe you're here today, and you believe yourself to be a pretty good person. You know, I'm a pretty good person. Even religious. I pray, I read my Bible, I go to church. And the Lord says, that's Mark chapter 7, the Lord says that all that wickedness resides in your heart. Do you acknowledge that? Do you confess that? And the Jews here in John chapter 19, the Jews are angry, they're defensive, they're self-righteous because Jesus reveals their hypocrisy. What about you? What about you? You will never be righteous. You will never be righteous through your law-keeping. You'll never be right, righteous by what you do. Jesus Christ is the only one who fulfilled the law. He is the Son of God. He is the only one righteous. And you need that righteousness. The righteousness that God says is yours by faith in the Son of God. Trust Him alone. Trust Him alone. Jesus Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And only he can change your wicked heart. What then will you do with Jesus who is called Christ? Maybe to this point this morning, you're still running with the mob of this world. If you haven't given it up, 
up to this point, you don't, you don't want to. You've lived for yourself and you know it, right? You haven't wanted to deny yourself. You haven't wanted to consider yourself dead to the world and follow Christ. And you know this morning you're not right with God. You know you're in open rebellion against him. Confess your sin. Acknowledge your state. Confess it this morning. Right? The time has come when you are confronted with the reality of your sin against God. You've broken his law. You've gone astray. You've turned to your own way. And God, your creator, offers you grace and mercy in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see in the cross, in the awful treatment that the Lord endured at the hands of sinners, you see the awful weight and penalty of your sin. What will you do with Jesus who is called Christ? You weren't there in the courtyard that day yelling, crucify him. But up to this point in your life, you've been complicit in his death. Turn from your sin. Turn from your sin. Come out of the mob today. Trust Christ alone and be saved. Maybe you're more like Pilate. Your conscience just weighing heavily on you. Your conscience accusing you. You know that the way that you're living is wrong and sinful and rebellious against the God who created you and gave you life, and gave you breath. But all that is in the world, right, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, have won your heart so far. They've won your affections to this point. But you know it. You know it. You are marching ever closer to a point of re no return. What then will you do with Jesus, who is called the Christ? Yeah, brothers and sisters, think with me for a moment. Where are the disciples? Where are the disciples at this point in time? They've, they've abandoned him. Peter denied him three times before the sun even came up the next morning. Right? And Peter, though the Bible says, wept bitterly. Wept bitterly. The Lord, in great grace, great mercy, preserves them. The Bible says, not many days from now, they are endued with power from on high. Holy Spirit comes upon them. And by the grace of God, with the strength that the Spirit of God supplies, they live and they serve and they preach the glory of his resurrection. So Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was raised for your justification. So brother and sister, what then will you do with Jesus who is called Christ? All praise all honor, all glory be to the one who, having loved his own who are in the world, he loved them to the very end. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we praise you and we thank you, Lord, for the sacrifice of Christ. Thank you that through him, the, the Son of God, giving himself for sinners, Lord, that we can be justified, forgiven of our sin, made right in your sight, clothed, robed in the glorious white linen of his perfect righteousness, Lord. We can stand before you, justified, stand before you, dead to the law, but alive to you in Christ that we can bear fruit for your glory, worship your name, have fellowship with our God. Lord, we praise you and thank you for these glorious blessings. I pray that not one person would leave here without clearly understanding the state of their own heart, their condition before you, that sinners, Lord, would be converted to you, that saints, the saints would be edified and or just fueled by that glory to serve you more faithfully, to love you as we should, until one day finally, Lord, set free from the fetters of our sin, we worship you and praise you and serve you for all eternity in the way that you are worthy to be worshiped and praised and served. We love you. Thank you for this text. Thank you for our time together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.